On this episode of Glowing Up Asian, we talk to professional basketball player and Lingo Ace brand ambassador, Jeremy Lin. We also spoke to his mom, Shirley, to get her take on what it was like to raise a student athlete like Jeremy. Together, we covered a wide range of topics from learning Chinese as a kid to taking advanced math classes while he was traveling with his high school basketball team for competitions. We also discussed Jeremy's mental health journey and how his relationship with his parents has evolved as they have learned to communicate more openly with each other. One thing that really stood out to me is how Jeremy's parents really instilled strong values in him as a kid and how that helped him navigate life on and off the court later on. I personally really enjoyed my conversations with both Jeremy and Shirley and hope that our listeners find the insight shared as valuable as I did. A few things to note about this episode, we recorded both interviews separately and then combined them together in post-production so that we could listen to Jeremy and his mom's points of view on different topics side by side. Also, the interview with Jeremy was done during a layover at the airport, so he had to run towards the end, but fortunately, we were able to wrap up with final thoughts from his mom. Hope you enjoy the episode. Really excited to talk to you, Jeremy. Welcome to the show. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Um, I'm excited to talk about all, a whole wide range of issues Great. today. You've had such an incredible journey, and in many ways, you've lived the dream for every Asian kid who's ever wanted to play for the NBA, but also for every Asian parent who's dreamed of their kid going to Harvard. I know this journey hasn't been without challenges, but before we get into that, I wanted to go back in time a bit to talk about your Glow Up origin story. You've shared in many interviews, including the HBO documentary, 38 The Garden, that you love basketball from an early age and that it was very much inspired by your father's love of the game. But before you got serious about basketball, what were your parents' hopes for you growing up? Did you always want to become a basketball player? Um, I wouldn't necessarily say that my parents had a distinct dream other than to be very educated. You know, I think they were thinking more like academia and they named actually me and both of my brothers. Our Chinese name is Ding Shu. Shu was named book. And then we all have different last characters. So, you know, I was literally named book. Like that's how, that's how you know, important academics was to my family. Um, I think, you know, the unique thing is that my parents uh, both had their own experiences where my dad wanted to be, you know, wanted to go into the sports and experience those, those types of things. And my mom wanted to experience music, but in both of their situations, um, their parents didn't necessarily, you know, my grandparents didn't necessarily, you know, okay that and so they knew they wanted to be a little bit outside the box but they weren't expecting professional basketball player for sure um they definitely thought like you know but my grandmother who is you know who was she passed away but you know she was a, a very renowned um historic female doctor um pediatrician and so you know for her literally every time i saw her it was can you play basketball can you please play basketball can you just Go into medicine, go into medicine. Like that was to her was like the the only path. That that must have been very uh, challenging to like navigate those conversations every time she brought it up. Yeah, I mean, I just was like, uh, okay, and then she like give me a home ball, and then be like, and then I just like run away. <laughs> um, she would give right, me like right, a red right, envelope, right. you know, with some money in it, you know, and it'd be like, hey, quick basketball, why are you wasting your time? That's so dumb. Da -da -da -da. And I'll look at my mom and be like, uh, all right, okay, yeah, I'll talk to my mom. And, I mean, we knew we knew that we it was it was expected every time I saw her. So when we talked to Jeremy's mom, Shirley, about her dreams for her children, she confirmed that there wasn't a specific accomplishment that she wanted them to achieve. Instead, she cared more about their character and the type of people that they would become. To me, successful means that they they character um, building, like, you know, um, I do agree with you. I consider myself a little successful um, because they all know who they are and they are honorable and they also care for other people and they live the life to, you know, to make people around them better and try to honor God. I think that's what I consider successful. Actually, yeah, my my dream for them also is character building. So for my 
older son Josh, um, he's kind of like you know his personality is more mellow, more inner person. So for for him, I just want him to be happy. So he know that you know from from when he was little, he knows I want him to be、uh, happy. For Jeremy, I want I want him to be humble because he's he's a smart person and he he. Show his character, you know, and so so I want him to be more humble. And even though he's very、um, talent, and for Joseph, I would just want to him to be do his best because sometimes he's a little bit lazy. So the, so all three of them, I have a different dream for them. That's my, you know, that's that's my goal. I wouldn't say my dream, and、uh, that's my goal. But they have their own dream, yeah. <laughs> I really love that, and I couldn't agree more. That a person's character really does say so much more about who they are than any of their accomplishments. But on the topic of dreams, I did want to ask you about one dream in particular that you had for Jeremy, which was for him to play the piano. In the HBO documentary Thirty Eight: The Garden, there's this really funny story that Jeremy shares about learning the piano and how the day you let him quit was one of the happiest moments of his life. Not to let him have the last say on this, I would. Love to hear your side of the story. Okay, I think to say that I have to say why I want them to play bass and piano. I myself love music, and I think that music or art that's an outlet for people to express your emotion, and so I think、um, they will be appreciated.、Um, and also during the time, my time friend、um, George need pianists very bad. You know, very certain people. You know, people know how to not just play piano, but you also need to be able to creative change. You know, upload the key or something like that. So, so I think you know, if they learn piano later, they can serve at the church even more. And but throughout their piano lessons practice, I you know they so resistant. Every time they practice, we have to put put up big fight every day, and there was one. And at the same time, I feel they really need writing、um, tutor help. So I was like, we only have so much time and so much resource. So, what's more important? Is writing more important or the piano more important? I don't. I mean, to a person who grow up doesn't know how to write, and you are disadvantaged. But if you don't know piano, that's fine. And they also spend too, so much time in basketball, and they love basketball. I don't have to fight with them for basketball. Actually, that's my tour. If you don't finish your homework, no basketball. Then they will finish it. If you don't get your grade up, then you you know. So 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 to a point, I was like, okay, piano is my dream, basketball is their dream, and they not really my dream. So I was like, okay. So I give them a time frame. If you don't practice three times、um, in a week, then you quit bass. You quit piano. And they thought I'm joking. So I I give them warning one time, two times, three times. I was like, okay, I just you know close the piano. Say from now on you don't have to play piano. And they first first in the beginning they was shocking. And and Jeremy called his friend. My mom told me to quit piano. <laughs> And he actually begged me, say, "It's okay. I, I want to continue." I was like, "No, you're not. You know,、uh, not until you open the piano. I'm not going to pay、um, any more piano lesson." So, so it turns out the the person opened the piano. It's me, not them. <laughs> yeah, I think they probably will regret it. You know, if、um, but you can. I mean, I can only do so much. I was like, I put in my resource. You know, I help you to learn, help you to. If you don't appreciate, then you don't appreciate it. If you le- want to learn later on, that's you, 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 you do it yourself. So that's the piano lesson. <laughs> About that, Jeremy, I'm curious. Before playing basketball professionally became your dream, was there any other career path that you pursued? I would say, if you're talking about dream, dream,、um, like there was a short stint when I was younger. My dream was, you know,、wow. I, I had it all the way up until until my like、mm-hmm. a few years into the NBA. I still had it plastered on the wall. It was my first grade 
you know, uh, student of the week. And in that it is it, it shared, like she wrote the teacher had written like Jeremy's dream is to play in the world <laughs> cup. Um, and so, you know, that was a dream of mine, uh, maybe just for a little bit of time, but after that it was, it was basketball. Interestingly enough, when we talked to Jeremy's mom, Shirley, she also shared with us another career that Jeremy was interested in pursuing. Jeremy, one, during one period of time, he said, I want to be a dentist. Uh, I look at him, I look at his hand, you know, he has a big hand. Your hand go into people's mouths, I don't think that actually work, but I cannot say that to him. So I was like, okay, that's good. You know, let's try a dental class. Um, so he, I think he's eighth grade, and he took an online dental class. And but also there was a, a couple lab he need to go to. And after that class, he was like, "Never mind, I will not be a dentist." And the rest is history, as they say. You know, to an outside observer, you seem to have struck a good balance between your academics as well as your extracurriculars. Can you share how you develop the discipline and motivation to be successful in both? I would say that like earlier on, it was very much incentive oriented as it probably needs to be for any kid growing up. And so, you know, early on, it was basically, if you don't do this, you don't get that, right? And so if I didn't finish my homework, I couldn't go play basketball. If I didn't get straight A's, I wasn't allowed to play on the basketball team. I think something unique that my parents did do, even though that rule applied to all three children, um, it wasn't necessary. Like with with certain children, the, the the standard for what you were able that you had to hit in terms of GPA to be able to play basketball and to join these basketball teams um, was different for each you know for each child based on uh, kind of a conversation and what we felt like was be more fair in terms of capability wise. And so I think for me, you know, my older brother like could actually get straight A's. I uh, don't think I ever got straight A's to be honest, but I was always kind of at the cusp. And as long as I was at the cusp of that, my parents were like, okay, you can put us. And so I think it starts with kind of principles, um, guidelines and incentives. And then at a certain point it kind of became You know, especially when I got to college, it became really just more of my own convictions around it. My first year, people don't know this, my first year at Harvard, I've really struggled. I struggled really badly with time management and just, I was just so, it it was just such another level uh, intellectually and academically. Like I was almost on probation. I I just, I almost failed classes. I was, I was really, really, you know, struggling to find my way. And that wasn't something where my parents were like, oh, if you don't get a C or above in this class, you can't play basketball. It was just something that I knew, like, man, I'm at, you know, this this university and I got to make it, I got to figure it out. And, and so um, that was just by then it became like kind of something that I believed. So it sounds like you had a very good foundation instilled into you from your parents so that when you hit challenges even if you, you did struggle, you still were able to navigate it and figure out how to get into a better place. So switching gears a little bit, I wanted to ask you about an academic subject that is very near and dear to many Asian parents, which is math. How was that for you? Yeah, you know, math was always my best subject. Um, and I think the unique thing was that my parents really tried to give me as much freedom in terms of like, if you want to go ahead, go ahead. And, and so there was a time when I left my public school because I felt like the, you know, it was too easy primarily. Um, there were times when, uh, when I was in eighth grade in middle school, I actually joined the local high school with a very first class. And then I would take ninth grade math and I would drive back to my middle school for the rest of the day. So my mom was able to set something up like that. And so my mom was always kind of like, look, if this is something that, like, really, if you're not, if you feel like it's boring and you're not intellectually stimulated, like, I'm going to do whatever I can't support you in that. Um, and that was really, and that was really cool. Um, and, then, and then my dad, who is phenomenal at math and has a PhD in, in his computer engineer, that's what my mom is, but um, he was kind of in charge of tutoring me and teaching me a lot of math. And so he would work, you know, uh, all day and then come home. 
and then eat dinner, like scarf down dinner, and then study what he needed to teach me, and then teach me that at like from like nine to ten at night. And uh, so you know, actually, you know, he had helped me a lot. I was able to get like a eight hundred on like SAT path two C and different things like that. I was able to do like and and kind of stay ahead in terms of math because because my mom and dad were actually very supportive. <laughs> But it was never something that they forced on me. You know, they were like, if you want to stay, if you want to stay with your grade level, you can. And that's the beautiful thing with Woods. I felt like it was a conversation and they really respected the path with it. I love how your parents made learning such an open dialogue so that you could have a say. And more importantly, to make sure that this was something you actually wanted to do. I actually think one of the things that I really appreciate about my parents is even though they wouldn't necessarily agree with me, sometimes they would make the decision for me. But they would at least explain it or let me hear what I had to say, right? And so if they made a decision like you must do this or whatever, at least to have the conversation for them to hear my side, like maybe two years down the road because they didn't know what I'm thinking, they're actually like, you know what? Um, actually, we tried it for two years when, you know, Jeremy on Mox had put a go in a different direction or whatever. Even just a peace of mind and the ability for me to kind of process my emotions by sharing and like having an open an open uh, lane of communication with them. I feel like that's actually something that uh, my parents kind of really did well. You know, don't get me wrong, they were strict. They were very, very strict. You know, on the same hand, like, I definitely was able to speak in mind um, and, and say what I felt. And, and, that, and that, was a help, that was helpful for us to understand each other, even if we got to the same results. Right, right. I later asked Jeremy's mom, Shirley, for her perspective on those years about how she and her husband were able to support their children and help them be successful in both school and in their sport. How do I do that? I don't know. Just crazy. It was a, it was a crazy time. I don't, I don't even, I think it's by God's grace. You know, even I look back, I was like, how did I do that during those times? Three boys, you know, and they all need time. And, and they all have a lot of stuff going on. I have, you know, and, but, yeah, through God's grace, I was able to do it. <laughs> I'm a very handsome person, so I'm pretty crazy about academic, but I also, I also think learning is fun. So, so like uh, I have a lot of education toys, you know, I look a lot of online of, you know, or, um, or hard copy of, um, extracurriculum. Um, so they do a lot of stuff, um, not just, academic but also extracurricular so you know I, I i just like i love to learn so i i do a lot of, so i look for extracurricular um to uh, even online class they out of them taking a, online class when they were young and um, which is not yeah which is not no more but they did <laughs> for jeremy has mass at that um teaching him mass because at uh, that year he really needs someone to help him. Um, he, not, not, not that like he is bad. He just, he took, um, Highland, uh, mass, but he also jump, um, jump a grade. So, so he taking very high level math and plus the basketball stuff, you know, he just doesn't have enough time. So we couldn't find, um, he also need to travel a lot. So he cannot stay like, you know, he have even, um, private tutor coming to our house doesn't work because his schedule every day is changing. Every week is changing. So that time I told my husband, you have to help him out, you know. So so when we travel to basketball tournament, they need to do he need to do mass um with that in the hotel. That just the life he you know he have to he have to go through. <laughs> You've been really open about your mental health journey and how you've learned to manage stress as well as the pressure that comes with success and how it's been a very long journey since your high school days all the way through university and then later the MBA. Can you share a little bit about what it was like during those formative high school years? The first time that I really, really struck but I don't. So when I was a freshman in high school, I would always go to young and play in these really, you know, these travel tournaments, elite competitions over the weekend. And basically every Sunday afternoon, I would be in a car or on a plane coming back to where I lived to get ready for school on Monday. 
And that's when like my parents were, you know, and, and freshman year was when my parents were like, look, this is, this is not middle school anymore. This, this counts. Like this is how you get into college off of this GPA and it starts your freshman year. So I knew like there was another level of expectation and just weight consequence. And I just like remember vividly at being in the back of the car trying to sleep and I and I couldn't sleep. Or if I fell asleep, I would like be jolt, I would like wake up with nightmares of failing the next the test that I was gonna take on Monday. And like it was just such an uncomfortable feeling I had no idea what was coming. Like and I dreaded, I literally dreaded these like Sunday night car rides in a cloud cloud like you know, it's gonna be that like, four hours of just like stress and anxiety. And I actually really like, you know, in my deepest, toughest moments, uh, starting then, it continued even at college, you know, in college, I still vividly remember calling my parents. So I was like, oh, and, you know, I called my mom and, and I was like, I'm gonna fail this class tomorrow. I don't think I'm gonna pass this class. Like, I literally don't like thought I was studying hard. I thought I knew, but now that I'm kind of going through a sample question, I don't think, you know, and, and I was like about to cry. Uh, and in those moments when I was like, struggling such intense anxiety, um, my mom would always say to me, like, have you done your best? Have you prepared your hardest? And if it was yes, she'd be like, and just do your best. And it's okay. We'll accept any so. And if it was no, then she would be like, well, why haven't you? That's not new. And we need to make sure she, you know, do that going going forward. But, you know, as for now, let's do our prescription miles test and let's change some things so that you are fully prepared. And for my mom and dad, it was really always more about like the, the attention, the heart and best effort. Um, and I think that was really important. Uh, yeah, my mom did a great job of kind of helping me through some in some really highly stressful situations in my, in my life. What advice do you have for parents, especially those from cultures where mental health is still very much seen as a taboo? How can they support their children or be better at recognizing when things aren't okay? I'm not a parent, so take everything with a grain of salt. And, um, but from my experience as a son, I would say, like I would advise parents like first thing you got to accomplish is you got to let your children know that you love them regardless of their regardless of how well they think they're not going to have a foundation firm secure foundation a bedrock a security knowing that they are fully loved and accepted and no matter what the test result is but the glue or the form use or the with competition results. I think that is a huge step. That's that's more. Number two, I would say to consistently, not just once, like consistently be checking up and asking questions. I think something that I've realized is sometimes there's things that parents want to say to children or children you say you don't know how to bridge it together. Right? Yeah. We don't know how to bridge that. For parents to expect for children to know how to do that and to kind of proactively do that is, I would say, somewhat somewhat unfair. I think the parents should be proactively trying to ask these questions. Like another piece of advice I would really give is like, when you ask, ask to listen, not to give advice. Like I remember like when my parents used to ask me questions because they knew something was up, they could sense something was wrong. Like, if I gave them, like, two sentences or whatever, and then they immediately jump in and give me a lecture, like, I would just shut down. Right? Like, and so, I, I would tell my parents sympathy, and then finally got to a point where I was like, Mom, you know what? I don't need you to tell me what you do. This. I just need you. Even though you find out about it, I was like, I just need you to this. And it was hard for her, but eventually she kind of figured it out, and it made us, like, it made our relationship so slippery at a deeper level where I was just like, man, my mom, knows when to listen and when to advise me and that was like a game changer as it relates to mental health i think the biggest thing that parents can kind of do is be fine the first time i've told my parents and i, I remember I, I told my parents i said you know I'm, I'm i'm in therapy now i have a therapist first thing my mom said to me was what's wrong what's wrong with you that's what she said to me and she could tell like i was hurt by that 
And so like after like quickly, she kind of was like, like, shoot. And I said, you know, mom, like maybe it's like, I kind of would describe it similar to like, if I get a, if I have a stance coach or a trainer for basketball or someone to help me get fit, you you have any problem with that? Does that mean that there's some problem? Like, is there some direly wrong with my body? Just, no, maybe I just want to be strong. I want to be more equipped. I want to get better in this area. Just because I have a therapist doesn't necessarily mean that there's something directly wrong. But even if there was, you should be supportive of that. And, you know, that, you know, having that conversation with her, realizing that, like, you know, mental health and mental health resources are just ways to help you know yourself better and equip you and help you process life. Like, it doesn't always have to be, like, this, like, very negative, desperate connotation to it. Uh, once we kind of broke that ice, her whole viewpoint on a change, actually, even recently, she had told me, she said, you know, if I had a therapist when, you know, if I could afford a therapist and if I had the opportunity and resources to when I, you know, at a younger age, I think my life would look really different. And I was like, wow, like, mom, that's like a huge turnaround from the first, like, what's wrong with you kind of impulse this year. And so, you know, you gotta be, you gotta, you gotta have room for grace on both ends because it's not gonna be perfect. My parents will say things that hurt me and I'll say things that hurt them amidst this process. But I think if you're coming from a place of like respect and trying to let's really listen to the other place, I do think a progress will always be made. I think that's so fantastic because there are so many Asian families out there that just culturally, they don't talk about how they're feeling. And so the fact that your family has been able to open up to each other is really, really, truly fantastic. Yeah, man, I, I would I invite the children to open up, though. I would say just open up, right? Like, I know it's awkward, and trust me, it's awkward. Uh, and, and I've tried to do that in many different ways, whether it's, you know, telling my dad I love you, you know? The first time I did it, it was so awkward. The first three, five, three to five times I told my dad I loved him, he didn't even say I love you back. But I just kept hitting me with him with that every so often. And then finally, he's like, you know, love you. And, and now it's more normal. It's like, love you, love you. You know, like, so... But it but it, it took it took some steps of courage to show up. We also asked Shirley, Jeremy's mom, whether she would have done anything differently knowing what she knows now. To me, unfortunately, I probably still will do more do a lot of focus on academic. Um, not just academic, I think that's a training process to me. You know, to him, he he may be thinking different, but to me because all those training he got, you know, self-discipline, time management. Um, I just mentioned earlier, you know, during the basketball tournament or he went to youth retreat um, or youth conference, other people can running around the hotel. He have to stay in the hotel, taking the online tasks or, you know, doing his homework. All those are time management discipline and that helping through his Harvard year, his, you know, his, uh, his, uh, even even MBA career or even now. Um, so I think that's important, but I think I probably will do different. It's give him more support, listen to him more. You know, when he say, I'm stressed, I'm stressed, I, a lot of time I feel like you're just nagging, you know. <laughs> but um, I, now I look back, you know, when we talk about more, when he grow up, you know, he mentioned, what happened before? Um, I think that during that time, I should listen listen to him more and more. Uh, this more understand and more, you know, um, and explain to him more why I'm doing what I'm doing, um, and also give him more positive comments um, and let him know, you know, he's he's doing great. You know, I, I think as an Asian parents, a lot of time we just focus on what's not being done versus what had been done. So I think that's something I, I need to give him more positive uh, reinforcement. Now that you've had some distance from those high pressure high school days, all the way to where you're now able to have these open dialogue with your parents, is there anything you would have done differently when you look back at that time? If I could like try to succinctly summarize it, it's not all, it won't all be able to, fall under this umbrella but the, the most common thing was that I felt like I knew what was best for me. Uh, I, 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 
that's like the one line synopsis and I was always kind of felt, I was always kind of feeling like okay I'm more mature now they don't know what they're talking about my parents don't know what they're they just don't understand they just see things differently I would advise every single child to do this with their parents but it was like there was a when I say it completely changed my perspective I took my mom half in the day we took went to a seafood restaurant and uh, we took a walk on the beach because that is kind of her favorite thing. I said, mom, we'll take you. We're gonna do our favorite, your favorite thing together. And for like three, four hours in the car, restaurant, and we in the car ride back. I basically just asked her, I asked her questions for like four hours. I just, all I did was ask, hey, where, you know, I knew, I knew where you were born and knew where you grew up, but like, tell me nuance. Like, what was it like? What was my grandfather or I never met? Like, what was my grandmother? What were your what was your relationship with your sisters? How'd you navigate school? Like all this stuff, it's just so shooting all this stuff. And I was just like, and she started sharing her journey. She started talking about how she came to the US. She started kind of in depth, how she and how they fell in love, different things like that. How they went through it, it like some deep trials and years. When I started I should start kid. She started talking to me about like some of the depression that she struggled with, you know, like, postpartum depression after having children. I mean, I was just peppering her with questions and learning so much about her story. And I'm telling you, when I left, I was like, I saw my mom in a whole new light. And I was like, you know, I understand why you actually think the way you think. I understand that, like, when I made it to the NBA and how to fix out why you were so, why you had such a staunch mindset, how that means she hey, and certain things. Yeah. Actually, after hearing my parents' story, still the same thing with my dad. But there was a lot of things about my dad that I didn't understand. Why would you do that? Why would you think like that? Like, what's wrong with you? And then I heard his story, and his story was like, man, he was like this. He was like this prodigy from a young age, and he basically was the only one. His his grandmother had, had only had an elementary school education, and he has four other uh, siblings. So there's five children total, and. They all like for, 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 you know, for went like gave up like the pursuit of better education because my dad was so elite. And so they, well, they started trying to make money for the family and everyone put their finances and hopes and dreams into my dad. And my dad had to be the kind that like every year had to score the best the school to get the better school and then send money back home and things like that. Like after I understood the pressure that he had been living with and the Invictory life, and how, you know, the story with my mom, and all these other things, and the people that he had lost in his life, life, in life, the age that he lost, I mean, I did how be locked up, I was like, you know what, I can see it, I understand it, and and so I'm telling you that, like, understanding your parents' story was, it is what I would highly, highly suggest to every child, like, really, really know your parents' story at a deep level, and give them a chance to talk because parents want to go out of their way to be like, hey, let me tell you every last detail about my life. I'm not really in the immigrant or Asian American parental experience. Or like, you don't see about that all that often. But, uh, man, I, it was, it was amazing. It was amazing. I still reference different things that they tell me about. Like, I still, it just shifts so many different perspectives, like, all at once. I had, it took a long time to even cross it. There was no understanding. It's good hopefully one day have that conversation with my own parents because it sounds like it was a very meaningful way to open up to each other. So when we asked Jeremy's mom, Shirley, about what was it like getting to know her son as an adult, she shared a very similar sentiment. I think um, I have to change my mindset. Um, he's an adult, so we more like a friend to friend instead mom to son. I still do mom to some, you know, but more like, more like a friend, um, most of the time. So need to treat him with respect and also, um, sharing with him, you know, what's in my mind, regardless, you know, whatever the situation is. Like, I think as a parent, usually we, we are kind of like a strong figure, you know, we handle everything. You just take it. But as he grew up, you know, I, I think more like, you know, I share with what's in my mind, whatever my frustration or my happiness. Um, I also show him more appreciation and give him more compliment. I think that that helps to building our relationship. 
Moving to another topic, I wanted to ask you about the work that you've been doing off the court with the Jalen LLC and the Jeremy Lin Foundation. Can you tell me a bit more about what has guided your decision making at these two organizations? You know, the CEO of, the, of Jalen LLC, Trisha Sajiji, has been challenging me, like, what is our goal? What's our long term goal? It's our legacy. And we kind of decided together that eventually what we need to do is kind of redefine love for the next generation. Um, and in, in the elevator pitch, it would be to redefine that for the next generation. I think, share a little bit more about that. It's really, we feel like, I mean, the love of Jesus is a different, deeper, fishy, great for you to love and simplicity of the love that you hear about in, in different places in society. And so how can we bring that type of love to the world to kind of exemplify, model, and share a little bit of Jesus' love to them. Um, as it relates to the Jalen LLC, that goes into a lot of the endorsements that we have, but also means to the impact investing. Why do we believe in investing, but why do we believe in investing in a way that helps in the next And again, bringing this whole zip of love, uh, how do we, you know, invest in a way that is really fake? You know, people that are really needy, for example, we, you know, we invest in a company that you know, like, you know, buy a, kind of, of a plot of land to so somebody who's more bankrupt. They redid the whole thing. And now um, they're selling these condos. And, uh, they, they're renting out the condos and we're earning a, a very nice profit from it. But at the same time, we're targeting, you know, single parent families, a widow, giving them a chance to have a place to stay, at least live one. Maybe they're, they're willing to spend that if this pot of wood in didn't exist. There's many different stories like that, but impacting is that investing, endorsements, I mean, even storytelling, 38 at the Guardian, uh, which recently won this, which recently we had Emmy, a uh, sports Emmy. That's, you know, the, the story behind that is very blood oriented um, and, and kind of having into the deeper socio political issues. Um, so that would be the Jalen LLC. Uh, business side of things and then we have the German Met Foundation which is on profit side of things which uh, Patricia's son the CEO also works heavily with our ED Foundation DD Stephanie Chu um, and they're doing a lot of stuff helping a lot with underprivileged children um, it's to specifically AAPI youth that are also targeting process there I can go on and on but really our two biggest hubs is the Bay area and we recently launched the Stronger Together Collaborate in New York City as well. And how has your own personal experiences when it comes to education and academics shaped where you put your efforts on and where you invest? Oh, big time. Education. Education is a uh, thing that's completely to um, And a lot of education is not necessarily just about what people may think when they think about it. A lot of it is even just an access resources or... You know, for example, you, you got to study, but in different places that we study, sometimes the biggest issue is just simple vitamin for supplement so that children aren't getting sick, right? Or sometimes it's, you know, actually just being able to afford or have glasses that take care, actually standing with blurry vision and or things like that. Like sometimes it's not always maybe what you would speak. Um, and, and even within, you know, certain, a lot of things, actually, especially since COVID, a lot of teachers, they're like, you know, actually beyond anything, what we would need with the most to be able to educate these kids is curriculum around self-confidence. And especially among students with the youth, mental health resources continually come up. Mental health resources and self-confidence are continually, continually coming up in heightened, exacerbated love since COVID that we've never seen before. Anything. And so these are all things that we're, you know, we're definitely working to. They leave the actors, they're all, we try to take small steps, not do everything, but try to right by the process and, and like that we kind of achieve a, 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 a game result. That's really interesting how even just something seemingly simple as providing glasses so that every child is able to learn can help level the field. And it's some things just as simple as basic needs. We're nearing the end of our time together, um, and I know you need to catch your flight. So I wanted to bring it back to Glowing Up Asian, which for many of us meant feeling split between two different cultures. Growing up in an immigrant household, how intentional were your parents about building connection to your heritage? 
I would say my parents would probably say they have some regrets around that. I would think that's a really good thing. Um, one of the most formative uh, memories and experiences I've had was, you know, we finally saved up enough, enough money when I was in, uh, I think at the time I was in, I was in middle school. So I, don't, I think it was sixth grade. Uh, we actually went to, we went to Pepe, um, and we went to Tech Bay uh, at that time. This is something that we could only afford like once every like 10 years um, to be able to bring a family of five and, and, and get to, you know, and, and fly there. And so, you know, obviously my parents as, as immigrants, it, 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 was, it is not easy financially. Um, but they definitely made it their priority or on Chinese Theater or whatever things like that. We definitely had celebrations and potlucks and things like that. I think they wish that they taught they wish they taught me a little bit more about like why things are the way they are. Um, like Dragon Boat Festival, Mooncake Festival, and, and you know, any of these a little bit more about it and, and what these things represent at, um, as well as kind of maybe being a little bit more you know, strong about enforcing Chinese and how we you know, were able to learn Mandarin, Mandarin uh, which, you know, we all can really did for a job at until kind of our 20s when you kind of like proactively on our own business and got a lot better at it. So um, that, that's what I would say, but I definitely, you know, uh, they never wanted me to be ashamed of my culture. That's for sure. Like they would invite my teammates, white teammates, you know, black teammates, whoever, they would definitely invite them and try to share, you know, uh, Asian culture with the rest of, you know, the world that we're living in. Uh, and so that is something that I always kind of saw. Wow, they're really unapologetic about it. And that really resonated. As an adult, you've become fluent in Mandarin. And I'm curious, was there anything you wish that you would have done differently or your parents would have done differently to learn your heritage language growing up? I would say that I really regret not trying harder when I was young. I just never felt like it was worth my time and effort. And, you know, you learn so much faster when you're younger. And you have so much more time to do with what you learn when you're young. And I just really, really regret it. Um, I think even doing small things like just replying to Chinese to our parents. Because my parents always spoke to me in Chinese and I would reply in English. And especially in the house, you know, in the home, it's like, I just want to wish that I just replied in Chinese. You know, at least, even if it was like I had to speak Chinglish and mix stuff in, and it was like, damn, like, I just wish I was a little bit more bold and uncomfortable. Like, I wish I was more okay with failure. I think that's a huge part of learning language, that's a huge part of growth, life, is that you have to be okay with failure and put, just, put yourself in situations that are possible. Or like you say things, you might say things wrong, you might not say things best, but because of that, you learn. I wish I had done that. So Jeremy literally had to go run and catch his flight right after he answered that question. Fortunately, I was able to continue the conversation with his mom, Shirley. I think learning Chinese culture is very important. I myself really appreciate it. And what about language? Can you share what that experience was like? It's very hard. Yeah, yeah. It's very, very hard. Um, they start with Chinese, but soon, once you know, once uh, once Josh has a when I was young, Josh has a better Chinese because only me I talked to him the most, right? But once the school start, he just automatically switched to English, and I still speak Chinese, but. They respond in English, you know, and to a point, it, I just have to speak in English to them. <laughs> it's hard, but, but I think um, for language, we all know if you don't practice, that doesn't matter. So so I see a lot of my friends and family, if they have elderly um, uh, grandparents at home, their Chinese will be better because they speak to them more often than than. And just, you know, just parents um, right. generation there. Now that they, they've they been working in Asia and they are using Chinese more, do they? No, no. <laughs> they, they, they will learn that. <laughs> yeah, they, they, they will improve their language for sure. Did they um, speak to you in Chinese now? Yeah, they speak a lot of Chinese now. They even. Oh, that's good. They even send me texts in Chinese sometimes. <laughs> oh, wow. 
That's great. That must be very rewarding to say, okay, they, they did learn eventually. Yeah, when that's a knee, they will, yeah, they will know, you know, that's actually good for them. Um, but it, it's very hard during their, um, their younger age. That is very true. Well, our time now is coming to an end. So to wrap up our conversation, something that I like to ask all of our guests is about their hopes for the future. Shirley, as a mom who has raised three successful adult sons, what are your hopes for the next generation of parents who are now raising their own children? I was still thinking building character is important. I think that's the foundation. Um, doesn't matter how successful you are, if you don't have um, vulnerable character, then doesn't really mean anything to yourself or also to the to the society. And also, as a parent, I do hope um, parents will understand our kids. It's not um, belong to us. They have their identity, and they may, they most likely they may, they will be different than we, who we are. And so we have to accept who they are, and you know, and also be our be truth to ourselves. Um, when we ask them, for instance, when I ask them to play piano, there were a couple of things in my mind, right? Um, first, I like music. I'm, I regret when I was little, um, my mom asked me to play piano. I just find a way to escape. And so I don't know how to play piano. Um, that's something I feel I'm missing. So I put that into my kids' dream. But they not me, you know. That's not their dream. That's they not they not, they will not feel that way. So 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 understand ourselves and be true to ourselves. Say okay, that's not their passion. That's my passion. So give up, you know. Don't don't put don't put too much pressure on that. Don't force that. And also be open minded. I mean, especially society changes so quickly. We cannot keep up with everything, but they need to grow up in, in the different, different um, environment. So we need to be open-minded. And also, I think we need to be more helpful. Helpful means, you know, um, when they need help and also um, help them to understand who they are. We just, you know, support them to help them and let them figure it out it's, it's what he want or that's not what he want. And also I think um, to be resourceful, you know, kids, it's a kid. Just like Jeremy said, you know, I want to be a dentist and we need to give him some guideline or guide to, um, to help him. Even when he said, I want to be a, he said, I want, I think I can be an NBA player. And I was like, oh, really? Okay. Um, so what do you want to do? You want to go through some training? So he actually, um, during his um, college year, he went to two summer and to train with some NBA player. Then, then I have you know conversation with the coach and to make sure that's not his kind of like out of blue thinking he's you know very good. It's also we we kind of like a um, have confirmation from other people um, say yeah actually he could be. So I think those kind of things as a parent can help our kids to to be, you know, successful in their career. Wow. I love that so much. Thank you so much to you and to Jeremy for taking the time. I love having these conversations with you both. And thank you so much for sharing your stories on the Glowing Up Asian podcast podcast.